Welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating, and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life. From actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children all ages, welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast, where we help you find balance in your day-to-day craziness of your day-to-day life. I am, as always, your host, John Morris, and I am absolutely delighted and so excited to bring today's show to you and introduce you to today's special guest. She is a mother. She is a wonderful wife. She is a life coach and a wonderful author of the book, uh, Common Sense, Happiness, Five Principles for Those Who Want to Stop Wine bitching and suffering. She is the wonderful, the lovely, and always, always amazing to have conversation with Laurie Bischoff. Laurie, great to have you on the show today. How are you doing today? I'm really great, John, and I'm super excited to be here with you. Thank you for having me on. It is an absolute pleasure. Um, Laurie, I've got to say, you know, from from our first conversations, uh, I believe earlier this year, you have proved just through following you through following your stuff on Instagram and on Facebook as well, to be one of the most gentle natured, inspirational ladies that I've ever had the privilege of knowing. For the audience that don't know, tell them a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got involved and ended up doing well what you do. Sure, sure. Well, I have been a personal performance coach for 12 years. And really what that means is that I help my clients perform at their best in all areas of their life. So I'm a holistic life coach. So I work with people not only on their mental diet and their emotional fitness, but also on their their health and wellness. And it, it, that's something that's been a passion of mine. Health has been a passion of mine for my entire adult life. Uh, so that wasn't new for me. It was a natural segue and, and uh, into um, you know, what I do as far as a coach goes. I think that, um, I think that being uh, willing to look at all aspects of your life, if you're somebody that really is looking for um, growth, personal growth, and your idea of happiness and peace and contentment, you kind of have to look at, um, pay attention to all of the areas of your life, you know, your health and, um, you know, the, uh, the attitude that you have about life, you know, what are you doing? Who are you being moving through the world? So we always look at all of those things and kind of try to get everything shored up and in alignment so that you, a person can create the kind of life that they feel really good about. That's really incredible. I mean, you know, it's so much to unpack so many things that are there. This past week, I've been reading uh, your book, which again, I, I, I will put over like a million dollars today because it's an absolutely amazing, amazing book. And um, just, just the, the title alone, Common Sense Happiness, and it's talking about the principles of it. Do you ever find it funny that, you know, again, and I was writing about this this morning, that oftentimes we know as human beings what we need to do, and it's often, it is the common sense but so many just seem never to, to get around to doing it. Why, why do you think that is, that they know what they need to do, but for some reason they just don't do it? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a broad question. I mean, obviously, <laughs> it's different, different for a lot of people. And, you know, it, is, it does seem like it's common sense. I mean, there's, it's really not that complicated, but for some reason, um, I don't have the answer. <laughs> we as human beings just love to complicate things. And, you know, we make things harder for ourselves than we need to. Um, and, you know, I, it's different for everyone. You know, we all have different experiences growing up and, and we all have different influences. And, um, and we, you know, 
kind of get installed a set of beliefs and values downloaded into our little children's brains, you know, when we're young. And then it's up to us once we become mature adults who can start to really think for ourselves. It's really up to us to to maybe take a pause and think about the values and the beliefs that we have. And are they true or are have we outgrown them? Um, do we have, you know, are there some things that we want to change that maybe served us well when we were young? Or maybe that's just what, you know, how the, the influence came from teachers and parents and everyone else that yeah. that's managing us as little tiny human beings. But at some point, you have to really sort of take a inventory uh, of yourself and decide if maybe there's some some attitudes and beliefs and values that you might want to reevaluate and make some changes in your life. If you're not happy, if you're happy and your life is great, then you know carry on. But but if you are suffering and you seem to yeah. be repeating the same patterns and having the same outcomes that aren't what you're looking for, then we have a tendency to want to uh, blame other people and circumstances and other situations for our discomfort and our suffering, but it's always us. Yeah. It's, yeah. Always, it's always us. We always have the choice to come back uh, to ourselves and our, our thoughts about the situation and what we are able to do as opposed to what we, what we can't change and feeling like we just have to live with things or suffer. I think that that's a, that's a sad belief that we just have to accept yeah. things as, as they are and, and suffer. See, I mean, I was I was blogging about this this past week, and it's and again, this isn't on my notes. This is just something that that came to my mind when you were talking. Um, for for me, I know I needed to get away from a lot of people, a lot of influences that were there that were really feeling, you know, and feeding negative, reinforced teaching that was there. And I I was speaking to a lady about this the other day that had um, commented on the post, and she was saying, you know, you know, what what kind of you feel, you know, feeling about that? And it was honestly that. Sometimes you need to get away by yourself and, and to really see what truth is and, and what it isn't. Um, but I want to pick up on a point um, that you made about children in particular. And, uh, you know, children are like this, the social sponge. You talk a lot about your uh, experiences in school. And, you know, especially, as I say, in your book, which we'll be focusing on a lot today, um, you know, what was it for you? Because I know a lot of people out there that absolutely hate school, but for you, what was it for you that, I guess, made you really dislike school and, and being there? Mm, yeah. Um, <laughs> You're not alone. Well, I think, I think the first thing that I can tell you is I was just naturally a very shy child. Wow. I was very shy uh, when, I was, when I was little. So being in a big social setting, a group like that of kids, was just uncomfortable yeah. for me. Um, so that was that was number one. I would just have preferred to not not be there. But the other thing that um, I realized as I got into my you know the older like in middle school and high yeah. school, I I I was just I felt like I was in a straight jacket in school. Mm -hmm. I felt like I did not like being told how I had to schedule my day yeah. if I had to ask and you know and get a special pass to go to the ladies room <laughs> uh, if I had to do things like gym class that I really didn't want to yeah. do and couldn't see how that was serving anything in my life you know I was a perfectly active young person outside of school I didn't like team sports so you know I just felt like <sighs> I just felt like um, my my freedom was really impinged upon <laughs> in school, and there were things that just didn't seem logical to me. I really like logic and reasoning, yeah. and you know when you have, for for instance, in my high school when I when I was that age, we had you know. Uh, periods of, of classes yeah. and I never I didn't have a first period class so it made no sense to me that I had to be showing up at you know 7 30 a.m. Yeah. in the morning to sit in a cafeteria and do nothing for an hour waiting for my first period class that just seems stupid you know why wouldn't I just <laughs> why wouldn't I get that extra hour of sleep and then come in on time for my class so things Absolutely. like that just uh, I just wanted to be out 
doing my life. I, I worked when I yeah. was in high school. I, I had a job, uh, you know, my whole life. So um, I just wanted to go out and work and mm -hmm. be out in the world. And, you know, school just seemed like... I mean, I know there's good things about school, and I'm not encouraging <laughs> people to drop out of school. You know, now there's a lot of more options available for, for getting your education Absolutely, even at that young yeah. age. But at that time, it was, you know, you were either going to school or, or you were a dropout. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, I, I was exactly the same, and, and you and I are so alike. And, I, and I, to people that I talk to, you know, share so many of the same journeys that I've shared just in, in different circles and things. Because um, I hated school as well, you know, it was just, and, and that didn't change until I was maybe 13 or 14. Um, it just seemed so big and overwhelming to me. It was like, oh my goodness. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, life obviously changed for you in, in quite a dramatic way. Um, and again, you know, stop me at any point that I've got facts incorrect, but hopefully I've done all my research properly. From 79 to 84, you drop out of the education system, or the, the, in, the institutionalized education system, shall I say. And, you know, this is on your pursuit to want to do something more and really exciting with your life. And you meet Eric. And at this point, your life is going to change dramatically. Now, I know a lot of the backstory, you know, and uh, I want you to share with the folks, you know, and, I, and again, I'm so excited about this. I want you to share with the folks, you know, just how life would change for you, uh, I suppose, when you met Eric and, and became part of his world. Yeah, it did change, um, I guess, in a big way because I, um, like you said, I, I actually dropped out. I, I was one of those dropouts. I dropped out of school in my senior year. I did get my GED, though. Um, and then a couple of years after that, a girlfriend and I, we started a business. We started an agency, a modeling agency in Minneapolis. And I, uh, I grew up in that business, so um, it was kind of a natural next step for, for okay. me. So we started that business. I was doing that at age uh, 19 or 20. And then that's actually how I met Eric was wow. we were both in that business. And so I met him, and uh, initially I... I really didn't think much of it because I, my in my mind, I mean, I thought he was a, a a very beautiful, gorgeous man. But in my mind, I was like, I'm on a career path here. I have, I'm I'm busy. You yeah. know, I'm I'm doing this now. Um, but that mentality didn't last long because <laughs> we hit it off really well, pretty fast. <laughs> so uh, so yeah. Um, as a 21-year-old, my girlfriend and I really did not have a lot of business savvy, so that business didn't last long. <laughs> uh, however, you know, the good thing that came of it was obviously I, I met the man that was about to be the man of, you know, m the love of my yeah. life. Uh, and so it was perfect. Um, but yeah, then we just, uh, my we just kind of said okay let's uh let's move to chicago let's uh live there for a while downtown and let's we just kind of didn't really have a plan we were just having a really great time together that's really good yeah yeah so that you know we ended up um we ended up not being in Chicago long, maybe a year and a half. I, I don't recall exactly, about a year and a half, and had a great time. Uh, and then um, realized when we were moving back to Minneapolis that, um, guess what? We're going to be parents. <laughs> 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 yeah, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have a lot of plans. <laughs> we just sort of, all right, this is what we're doing now. Wow. So. Uh, Anyway, that's um, that's kind of the, uh, the the Reader's Digest version. We had a we had a wonderful time together. Uh, you obviously we got married. We ultimately had two children, and now we've been married for over thirty six years. Wow, it's incredible. That really is incredible. How old? Uh, I suppose I should say, what year was it that you had your first? Oh, for your it, children, I suppose. Yeah. So first one was nineteen eighty four, and the next one was nineteen eighty five. Okay. Okay. When we come into this world, we come in with a sense of awe and wonder, believing that things will work out for the best, filled with excitement. We play like children and we enjoy our lives. But as we get older, we find out that everything maybe isn't as rosy as we first thought it would be. 
live life long enough and you realise that what once seemed like happy families can very quick turn into Dungeons and Dragons. Have you ever experienced anxiety, worry or maybe even fear on an insane level? I want to let you know right here, right now that you're not alone. Everything from homelessness, betrayal by my best friend, abandonment from the people that I thought would have my back. In fact, I've experienced so many different situations to tell you all would take a very, very long time indeed. But the good news is I'm here to tell you that, well, they've left their mark on me. I've come through all of them. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I've got a brand new book. It's called The Battles That We All Face. This book is designed to give you encouragement. It's designed to give you hope. It's designed to teach you, to challenge you, to get you to think a little bit more. The full title is The Battles We All Face, a devotional with a difference. Because I don't want you to just read it from start to finish. I want you to take time over this. I want you to read the first chapter and really process it. This book is designed, if nothing more, as I said, to challenge you, to encourage you, to give you hope, but ultimately to let you know so whatever you're facing, you, my friend, are not alone. I want to encourage you right now to not let fear or the past stop you from living an amazing, amazing life. Each page in this book has one of my art pieces in it and has been specifically placed there to give you, the reader, an association to the subject discussed. Please don't delay. You owe it to yourself to start rebuilding your life. Life is not over until you draw your last. Don't delay. Order today. Life is short. You owe it to yourself, as long as you're drawing breath, to stand up and fight for the things that you want in life. And my friend, you've got an ally in me who understands completely what you're going through. Have an awesome day. Click that link below and I'll see you on the other side. Now, the reason I want to ask that is, you know, because, you know, 1991, Eric goes for, and this is just to give folks the backstory. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up, you know, a humongous wrestling fan. And I know, you know, we're, we're going to get into this because this is kind of the backstory and the other side of what a lot of people don't really get to know about. Um, and I was so absorbed with wrestling, thoroughly loved it. It's all I ever wanted to do. Um, and then I got involved with bodybuilding and so many other things. Um, and, and life changed humongously for me. But about two years ago, getting involved with the, the wrestling paintings, was at the convention, Eric was there, got to meet Eric uh, and so many of the others. But I wanted to ask you this, um, I was supposed to, to set the, the, the stage as it were. 1991, Eric goes for a job with WWF at the time, now WWE. Biggest wrestling company pretty much that there is. He doesn't get the job, but he ends up in WCW. Now, for those of you that don't know, WCW is the rival, you know, organization. You know, you've got number one, number two, and they kind of changed places over the, over, over the years. Um, from there, you know, it's, it, it kind of has to get crazy because I know WCW probably had maybe 150 to 200 dates a year. WWE, you'd be on the road 300 days a year. So there's a lot of traveling. You're, at that point, a young mom you know you've got two young kids um and all of a sudden eric maybe isn't as around as much or he's really busy in in the life that's going on what was that really like for you during that time mm. <laughs> I'm, i guarantee all right. that isn't a question you get asked a lot <laughs> let me just get uh okay so yes all right so let me just drop a little um, note about that to Eric. Um, yeah, I never, I never saw um, the wrestling business as part of my future yeah. um, when I met Eric in, you know, in the modeling industry. That was something I would never have guessed. Um, turned out to be amazing, but yeah, it wasn't on my radar. Um, Eric wasn't in that business when I met him. And then he was in, a, he got into the wrestling business in Minneapolis. Um, 
and was with the AWA with mm-hmm. Vern Gagne um, before he uh, was course, ended up yes. working for WCW, yeah. right? Um, but yes, yeah, so by the time he ended up going to WCW, our kids were like age six and seven ish, mm-hmm. or five and six ish, and uh, and so he was commuting. Uh, right. We were in Minneapolis, and and of course they were uh, home base was Atlanta, yeah. Georgia. So. Um, so it started out with just a couple of days a week and that was, that was not bad. That was fine. And, you know, life was changing for us and, and it was very exciting and everything was good, but, but gradually those days of traveling picked up and he was gone more and more frequent, frequently. So that, um, yeah, that became a little bit, uh, difficult. It really, uh, I really noticed it, especially even with our with our son, because he was at that age mm-hmm. where you know he's about six or seven, and in Eric was such an amazing father. Always, yeah. he spent a lot of time with with um, with our kids individually as well as our family time. So when all of a sudden Dad was starting to be gone more than he was home, yeah. um, I noticed it even more in our son. He was missing his dad, yeah. and he was. Because Garrett was starting to misbehave a little bit, <laughs> so I I was like, you know what? Um, I think something's got to change here. And uh, and then and we realized as momentum was picking up with his role there, mm-hmm. it was definitely time to move. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you a fun story. Um, we lived kind of out out in the country a little bit in uh, outside of Minneapolis in a little town called Prior Lake, and uh, we had about three acres. And our house there w- had a septic system. And um, and this was about the time we were starting to think about maybe we should be you know relocating to Atlanta. And the traveling was getting to be a lot. And I um, one night we were kids and I were sleeping. It was maybe about Eric was gone. Uh, it was maybe about four or five in the morning, and I was awakened by the most horrific assault to my senses that I could possibly ever wow. put into words. And I thought, what is happening? Something is really wrong here. And I got up because my whole house smelled horrifying. And I got up and I and I went down into the basement and we had had a lot of rain and I don't know, something to do with the water table and the septic and it had backed up into my laundry room in the basement. (laughs) And so here I am, you know, with my two sleeping kids, my husband is, I don't know, Atlanta or some, wherever they were. And, uh, and I'm standing there with a um, laundry room full of things I would rather not ever see again. (laughs) wondering how I am going to ever get the stench out of this house. And I made the decision then, we're moving and we're doing it really, really fast. That's it. So it was uh, in short order. Um, we arranged for me to get down to Atlanta and I went house shopping. I think I bought the first house. This will do fine. Uh, sold. <laughs> and we moved fairly quickly. Wow. Oh boy, what were you doing around that time? When it was, were you still running business, or were you um, do, doing other things? Obviously, with the kids and things. It, yeah, at that time, um, I was no longer w- running a business or or working. Um, actually, when before Eric started working for um, in traveling yep. to Atlanta before WCW, I was literally waitressing. Okay. I was waitressing at a at a place nearby. But then when he started traveling, I stopped doing okay. that because you know I can't be two places at yeah. once. So I was then really just you know taking care of the household and the kids and doing you know doing mom and mm-hmm. and managing everything, which was great. I loved it every minute of it. Um, so it was uh, it was not hard to pick up and move. I don't even think I locked the door when I left. <laughs> It was kind of like you go into it and it's like, well, this one doesn't have a septic tank that's uh, that's backed up. I'm going to take this one. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> oh, boy. Exactly. B- before we move on, I, and again, this wasn't on my list, but I wanted to ask because I know in the mid-2000s, things changed again. Obviously, you know, as, as time goes on, WWE bought WCW. There was a lot of different challenges, a lot of different changes. Eric ends up going to the WWE and is gone probably a lot more, I would imagine, uh, than he had been probably previously. 
What was that like for you at that point? You know, actually, he he wasn't because um, because when he went to WWE, he was basically talent. Yeah. So he just, you know, show, you get there, you do the show, and you leave the next day. Right. With WCW, you know, not only was Eric running the company because he was the president Absolutely, of the yeah. company, full-time job, and he was also, you know, playing a role yeah. as talent on the show. Mm -hmm. So that, that, you know, took a lot. Um, so actually there was less demand on him and his time when he right. went to WWF or E. Yeah, yeah. They, they, whatever well, it was at the time. Yeah, <laughs> it, it keeps changing. I know, <laughs> but you know, I mean, that, that's an incredible, you know, story and, and a very, very inspirational one because I know there are a lot of folks out there that really never, and that's why I really want to pick up on that from your point of view because a lot of folks that that will see this, you know, their husbands and wives go to, to work nine to five. They see them every day. They come home, you know, and they get sick of them very, very quickly. Um, but what tends to happen, obviously, from your perspective is, you know, Eric was away, he was, he was doing, you know, and a lot of busy, busy stuff and, and you're home, as I say, and you relocate very, very quickly, um, which is a really amazing thing. You know, again, like you say, you loved raising your children, you loved, you know, being mm. mom, you loved having that. I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I suppose moving away from that a, a little bit, in your book, you write a lot about people's beliefs and standing firm in their beliefs. Um, and it seems to be whenever I, you know, because I, I make it a point not to watch the news because um, usually it's mm -hmm. doctored by opinion and, and other things. But whenever I see it on social media and it's, it's usually one or the other, you've either got one side that just kind of goes with anything and everything now. And you got the other side, whether it, you know, be really, really extreme. Um, but it seems that people really struggle with their beliefs nowadays. And I, I suppose I want to ask you, do you feel that it's peer pressure, um, a lack of conviction or something bigger, you know, for, from the people that you've, I suppose, worked with, talked with? Um, what, what's your thoughts? Hmm. Good question. Um, you know, I think when... That's, you know, that's a deep question. I think that, you know, part of it is, is like what we were referring to before is just, you know, what have you, what have you grown up with yeah. and have you, you know, have you um, crafted as an adult with some experience now in the world yeah. and uh, maybe you finally, uh, ha you know, are at a point where you have a job or a career, maybe you have a family and have you taken the time then to reevaluate um, your beliefs and your values and and have you taken the time to kind of craft your own personal constitution and if you are part of a family unit that you've now created what's what is yeah. what are you teaching you know your kids I think that um, I think there's a lot of people telling people how to think yeah. and I think that that has ha been happening more and more over the past several decades <laughs> yes. in our schools yeah. and so what what is of great concern to me and I know a lot of mm -hmm. others is that uh, the kids are being told what to think and l less how to think yeah. So now we have a lot of people, especially young people, that um, that are doing less critical thinking and really looking at trying to look without too much emotion at just the reality of different points of view. Um, I don't know if I'm if I'm digressing if I'm no, getting no, way off it, the point of it. your question again, but but I think that it's really important for people to to basically try and take some emotion, especially when it comes to like what you were, you referred to like the political situation, mm -hmm. the news, yeah. um, just different points of view on, on that and other really important topics. I think that, you know, there's a lot of, and the media is, is so guilty at the, uh, of this and they're really good at it. They, they really um, play on people's emotions. Yeah. And when you play on people's emotions, um, people tend to think more about how they're being made to feel 
rather than just critically thinking and taking the emotion out of it and just looking at, you know, facts or, or being able to weigh different points of view uh, carefully without getting emotional about it. Um, and it. And I think it doesn't mean that you can't uh, bring your heart into making decisions about things, but, but you can't only bring your heart in. You ha we have brains and the capacity to reason and logic. Yes. You know, we have that as well as our heart. So I think it's really important for people to try to use both of those things when they are making decisions about, you know, important situations politically, mm -hmm. Um, you know, when it comes to the law, when it comes to just right and wrong and how people treat each other, both of those things have to come into play. And yeah. I think we're at a point where people have been whipped into such a mm -hmm. frenzy, particularly this year with, yeah. you know, and it's everything is just fear based. It's just so much fear mongering mm -hmm. that, you know, unless you are somebody that is really willing to to shut out all of that noise yeah. and and calmly just really look at things from a calm perspective mm -hmm. without emotion, uh, too much emotion, um, it, you just end up getting swept up into that energetic current and then it become you become vulnerable and uh, easy, easily swayed yes. by other people's opinions. You know, when you're full of emotion, mm -hmm. that's when you get a mob mentality. Yeah. And that's not necessarily a, a good place to be. It's interesting that you picked up on, uh, and, and that whole thing, you know, I, I, I'm gonna do a cheap plug here for my own book because it, it, there's, a, there's a very specific reason. Uh, I'm currently writing a book, it's called The Battles We All Face, and it's available at thebattlesweallface.com. The reason that I bring that up is because I was writing a chapter this morning about, you know, the, a lot of people say there's many different types of people, and there are, but if you narrow it down to two, you've got your reactionary and you've got your passive. And, you know, reactionary are the ones that literally react to absolutely everything, every piece of social media news, every fake news. Uh, we call it magpie syndrome in the business world. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I love that, that idea. Um, then you've also got the passive, which is nothing seems to really, it, it's not that it doesn't bother them, but they don't respond in the same way. And, you know, you, you see that so much in the world now of people particularly, and, and, and we are gonna be doing a future show about this, uh, about Black Lives Matter, and not just the reaction that people give to all the incidences that, that have been going on, but you know the the protests that have been going on during a, a global lockdown and i've still never been able to figure that out um and i don't want to speak out of turn but i still question how you could have ten thousand people during a global lockdown meeting together with no masks or anything like that and it's just you know it, it's it's the extreme reaction now that people are going to be or that people are going to because of their beliefs obviously during covid um my goodness, people, scaremongering, fearmongering, whatever you want to call it, you know, was a massive, massive thing. And you saw people go to ex insane extremes, even some, you know, wonderfully respected business professionals. Um, you know, how, and, and again, this wasn't on my list, but how was, you know, the, the news of COVID and everything, how was it for you guys? How did you respond to, to that? Was it, oh my goodness, this is terrifying, or was it, okay, let's take a breath and kind of see mm. what goes on here. Yeah, that, that's really more our style. Um, neither one of us um, scare easily, <laughs> number one. Um, and number two, um, I did not have any fear about if somehow one of us was, was unfortunate enough to contract the virus. Um, in my mind, I thought, well, First of all, I'm about 99.99% .99 sure I will not ever contract it because I'm an insanely healthy person. Yeah. Um, but if, which also means if I do, I'll be sick for a week or 10 days and then I'll be better. Yeah. So, you know, I really wasn't worried about it. Um, and, and really, Eric has the same mentality. Um, I think that, I think there's, there's a lot of overreaction. Yeah. I understand it because there are a lot of people that are vulnerable. So I, I get that. Um, but I also think that there have been some, um, well, let's just say that there's been a lot of measures being taken that 
contradict each other. Yes. There's, been a, there's, a, there's a lot of people just arbitrarily deciding when things need to be done and when they don't need to be done, like masks and social distancing. And it's, it's all over the map. Yes. So, you know, you can't blame people for being, um, you know, confused and in a state of fear because, you know, this has been a, a, a new thing mm -hmm. and there have been a lot of people negatively affected. Yeah. Um, and that's terrible. But at the same time, you know, I, I get annoyed when I hear about all of the new cases and I hear about the deaths and, I, and you hear about all of those things. But what is annoying is you don't hear about all of the recoveries. Yeah, yeah. And that, to me, why, why don't we hear about mm -hmm. that? Why, why are we letting people believe that if they get sick, it's probably a death sentence yeah. and for many people that's true and those people should be protected mm -hmm. absolutely but for the majority of society yeah. it it's not true the worst that's going to happen is you'll be sick and uncomfortable for a bit and then you'll recover yeah. and you'll be better so i just wish that and i'm not trying to minimize no, the no, seriousness no, of it at all at all um I mean, like everyone else, I have family yeah. and, and friends that are vulnerable, and I want them to mm -hmm. be safe, of course. But I just feel like we, we only get one side of the coin, yeah. and we, we don't get the other side that gives people a little bit of, um, you know, some reason to yeah. relax a little mm -hmm. bit and feel like, okay, well, there, there's hope. It's, it's not the end of the world, and, you know, things, things are going to change. Yeah. But right now, this... Oh, all of the all of the stuff that is being put yeah. out constantly in our faces is it makes it really scary for people and um, again that's why I think it's so important that you get a balance of information yeah. if you can and you just really use some critical thinking and not just let um, the media and all of the craziness be dragging you around by your emotions um, that's absolutely a, that's not a fun you know, that's not a fun yeah. emotional place to be in. It, it's not. And I mean, there's so much to unpack there, you know, for, from, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, politicians are doing the best job that they can. But the problem is they're sending out so many confusing messages between it's OK yeah. to me. It's not OK to me. It, you, you, it's OK to do this. It's OK to do. So people naturally are confused. You know, with regarding what you were saying to the media, you know, it, it's because it's a story and it keeps selling. And as long as they keep putting that negative stint on it, that's, you know, what's going to keep selling. It's sad, though, like you say, that you don't hear the other flip side of the coin. I have a lady that will be interviewing here in a couple of weeks, Tamika Sheldon, talking about Black Lives Matter. She contracted it, I think, within the first week of it being out. Um, we were all like, oh, my goodness, is she going to be all right? Is everything OK? She came back and she was fine. The other was no issues. You, you, again, with, then with the conspiracy theories and, and people like, well, is there going to be a chip that's injected into us? Is there going to be, you know, vax? You know, and it just goes on and on and on. And it's very easy in some ways to get sucked into people's mm -hmm. opinions and people's views and, and all that kind of, you know, crazy stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, obviously, you know, the, the, I suppose in some ways the, the whole title of, of today's uh, conversation is is about beliefs and what people are forcing and what people are believing and what they're not believing um, yeah it's just yeah yeah and that, you know John like all of the things that you just said about you know the the media and all of the crazy information and all of that you know and people are afraid and um, and they don't know what's coming down the road yeah. what's are we going to be forced to have vaccinations are we going to be forced to do x y and d yeah. you know there x y and z there's always there's all of this what if yeah. and what's going to happen and so people are now um, not in only in a state of fear about what's going on immediately around them in the present but now they're also in a massive state of fear about what might yeah. be coming down the pike for them yeah. and so you know people's now uh, imaginations are are running into what might yeah. be there and how do I deal with that and that again is it it when you have that kind of thinking when you're really worried mm -hmm. about a future that doesn't exist yet yeah. about scenarios yeah. and stories and potentialities that don't that they're not in, existing yet but yet you are generating emotions around those imagined things you really put yourself in a in a um in a place of 
of not having, again, any control yeah. over your current state. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of the things that, that I work a lot with mm -hmm. uh, with my own clients and I talk about in the book is what is happening right now yeah. and, and can you just focus on the things that are in your control? Definitely. And, you know what it, and what is in your control mm -hmm. is how you're going to react yeah. how you're going to respond how do you going how are you going to feel about it what's the meaning you're going to apply to this and and then take it each day mm -hmm. but trying to but getting upset over things that are outside of your control now yeah. again it's self-imposed suffering absolutely it's, it's what i call the snowball effect because you know i i am an anxiety sufferer at times and with bpd um you know, and, and one of the things that I kind of teach now and kind of talk about is, you know, the difference between rational fears and irrational fears. If it's a rational fear, kind of sit down, figure it out, you know, and, and say, right, mm -hmm. is it paying the bills? Is it, you know, making dinner? Is it, you know, w whatever it might be. If it's an irrational fear, you need to grab hold of those before they start to snowball and become bigger and bigger and bigger. bigger. And that's really how I learned how to cope with anxiety. Because I would sit there and say, mm -hmm. okay, why am I really getting, you know, over the top here? And I think now, certainly um, with the work that we're doing with Mind, Body and Soul, there are more and more people that are coming out with anxieties and mental health. And, and we were talking to Gabe Nathan last week who works at Suicide Prevention. And he was saying, you know, within the next six months to a year, you're going to see a lot more cases um, that really, really rise. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you as well, you know, about uh, a p particular passage in uh, in your book. Uh, for those of you that don't know and I haven't plugged it enough, it's called Common Sense uh, Happiness, Five Principles for Those Who Want to Stop Whining, Bitching and Suffering. Uh, Laurie Bischoff's uh, incredible book, and I encourage you all to check it out. But she has a specific part where she's talking, she's a child, and I believe you were six years old, um, and you're standing in the mirror. And you're looking in the mirror and you're thinking, as, as a lot of kids would do, and I'm sure I probably did it at times as well, and you're smiling and thinking, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and pretty and everything else. Um, funny side story there, and, and probably folks won't, won't even notice, but I was, you know, at one time a, a natural physique bodybuilder. It was where my first career was and did a lot of stuff there. And I remember telling my mom, and the reason that I bring this story up is because it's similar to, to what you went through uh, with, with, your, with your mom and dad. But I remember saying to my mom, it's like, mom, I want to be a bodybuilder. And she actually turned around to me and said, they're all posers, those bodybuilders. And I kind of turned to her, I was like 17. I said, well, that's kind of the point, is it not? And, and so, <laughs> <laughs> my mom didn't get a lot of things like this. It was, you know, my mom lives in a very structured world, nine to five jobs, you come home and, and that's it. But mm -hmm. what, what I wanted to ask you was, the, the, the story that you tell, you're six years old, you're looking in the mirror, your dad comes in and discourages you from looking at yourself in the mirror. You know, in, in his mind, it's a vain thing to do. And, you know, and then he, he not only says that, but he gets your mom in it, on it as well to back up what he's, what he's saying. Um, you know, for, for any child or any adult, in fact, you know, when you're being told these things, this is really enforcing a, you know, a, a belief, as it were, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, you, you shouldn't be looking in the mirror, it's vain to look in the mirror, w whatever it was. How was that for you, I suppose, going forward? How did that really change things, I suppose, in your psyche when you looked at yourself in the mirror? Yeah, yeah, and that that's a it's such an interesting story because it was just such a brief little yeah. like nanosecond mm -hmm. in time, you know? And I and I didn't it didn't stick in my mind and it but it resurfaced yeah. when I was writing the book and I don't know somehow it just it just came it has to the a habit surface. Of doing that. <laughs> Right, right. But it wasn't something that like from that moment on, I never yeah. forgot what my dad said. I did forget. And then it, and then it surfaced. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it was interesting because <clears throat> the attitude was that you should not be liking yourself. The attitude, I mean, because, you know, I was, I was looking in the mirror and I was, yeah, maybe five or something like that. And, and I was just, you know, when you're only five, yeah. you've only been on the planet for a minute. Mm -hmm. You're brand new. <laughs> and I just think all children should be looking at yeah. themselves as, as something delightful, right? As something just amazing. And they should like themselves. They should love themselves. When people are happy with themselves, like themselves, love themselves, yeah. they have really no desire to inflict pain on anybody else. 
So it's kind of a fundamental thing that, you know, we should be teaching all of our children that they should all be mm -hmm. loving themselves and taking care of themselves and then extending those feelings to other people, to, you know, their, their friends and, and everyone else. But, um, I, uh, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. I just think that when people grow up, um, you know, and I think because my dad, let me back up a little bit, um, like a lot of people, especially people of that generation, our older generations, um, you know, it's, there's a confusion there between um, valuing and loving yourself and having self-worth, and that could get confused with vanity or, you know, feeling like you're better than someone. And it's not about that at all. They're, those are two very different things. You know, you, you're not trying to place yourself above anyone. Um, it, it's, it's just totally about recognizing the, the value that each of us in our individuality, um, what we are, who we are. We're all, you know, we're all, we're all divine creatures. Yep. So um, I think that, I think that being um, willing to look at yourself that way and, and, and be okay and look at what's right about you, look at what's good about you, look at the fundamental, you know, things inside. That's really important and it's important to teach our kids. And, and yeah, I, you know, our parents just didn't get it. Uh, <laughs> but I think, I, I think my mom, my mom got it more, you know, but my dad, uh, he, but he was dealing with the tools that he had, you know, he had a crappy upbringing. He didn't have a great mom. It was, you know, so he wasn't taught those yeah. things. So, you know, he misinterpreted what was, what was going on in the brain of his five-year-old daughter. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's okay. Cause I understand that now. And fortunately my mother had, um, she had an, she had gotten me into modeling business as a child. So I was working as a model, a child model, and then, you know, did that all the way through, um, through my twenties. Um, so I kind of had a little bit of, of natural sort of a counter to that attitude that he had, because, you know, the whole thing about modeling is you're, you're sitting there and, and everyone's looking yeah, at you. Absolutely. It's all about how you yeah. look. Yeah. So, so there was a kind of a counterbalance to that. And, you know, I eventually, as I got older, I, I sorted through things and figured it out. And, and it's all good. It is. I mean, it, it's nice when you can look back and you can understand why your mom and dad did what they did. And as you say, they're a product of their generation. And yeah. that's something that I always encourage folks, you know, again, when, when we're talking about these horrible issues that my dad was horrible to me, my mom was horrible to me. It's something that we do talk about a lot, you know, about just trying to see it from the other side of the coin. The, we, we do a lot of teaching called the Rubik's Cube, where you can see other perspectives and, and other things that are there mm -hmm. and not just your own. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about uh, in the last couple of weeks, in fact, is about the millennials and kids that were born, you know, from the millennium onwards. Society is changing in a humongous way. Um, and there's a lot of good and bad, obviously. With the millennials in particular, one thing that I have personally seen is the, I suppose, the willingness to enjoy themselves a lot more and enjoy, you know, being who they are, being comfortable in their own skin and putting a lot more goodness overall out into the world, which is incredible. It really is. In your book, you talk a lot about holding your own power. And I wanted mm -hmm. to get your thoughts about what that means as it relates specifically, if you can, um, to teenagers mm -hmm. in, I suppose, in the world today? Sure. Yeah, you know, so, so basically, um, holding your power is, uh, is about gaining control over your thoughts and emotions, um, because lack of control um, over those things is the biggest cause of our unhappiness and our suffering, not being able to manage that. Um, and when you can't manage those things, um, as I referred to earlier, it's easy, especially for young people, because you want to be accepted, you want to be part of the group, you don't want to be an outsider. So that makes it easy for you to get caught up in the energetic current, um, you know, of everyone else. And it's, it's, a, it's tough for young people um, because, 
again, you know, we're just, as humans, we're, you know, we, we want the, it's one of our most powerful psychological human needs is connection. You know, we, we don't want to be outside and shunned from the tribe. We want to be part of the group and we want to be accepted. Um, and that's, that's part of our nature. Um, but if you don't have um, a, if you don't have a counter at home to what is influencing you when you're not at home, it, it makes it easy for young people to get swept up in the, in the beliefs yeah. and the uh, behaviors of those around them that they want to be part of. And so it's really important, I think, for, for parents yeah. to make sure that you are instilling, you know, whatever your family values are, your, your family constitution, your family mission um, in your children so that they have the strength um, and the conviction of their values so that if they have some choices to make, um, it's a little easier for them to make what they feel is the, the best choice based on their values um, as opposed to not having any. Uh, and not having any strong convictions about anything, and then you know you're just um, you're you're swept up yeah. in whatever is going on around you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was something that I learned in my time as a youth worker. That um, you know it all starts at you know it all starts at home, and that was one of the biggest battles that we found was because so many times you're teaching things, you're trying to install the morals, but if there isn't the backup from home life, yes, you do get the rare exceptions where you know this kid is just going to break out regardless of what so you know social circumstances are there um but more often than not they just as you say get swept up get swept along on the next wave on the next current and things um yeah. and it's it's very very difficult i think for a lot of them to you know to, to really you know be, be able to uh, hold their own power and hold their own identity as well a lot of the time yeah yeah when you know when you feel um when you understand that you have, as a young person, anyone, but talking as we are now yep. about younger people, um, understanding that you um, will feel so good about yourself if you are able to hold your power. So, you know, meaning whatever, whatever your beliefs and yep. values are, if you can stick to them, if you can have a set of standards and a set of beliefs that are important to you that you know if you adhere to those standards and you adhere to those beliefs you are going to be able to sleep well at night you won't have things to feel bad about or guilty about because you have the integrity to, to stick to your beliefs and your standards and your values and when you practice that that takes practice because it's very easy for us to be swayed by those around us it's really easy even as adults um, um, but it, the more you practice doing that, the better you will feel about yourself. And really, that's what's the most important is how do you feel about yourself, you know, at the end of the day? Do you have regrets? Do you think, wow, I wish I wouldn't have said that or done that or gone along with that? That's not really what I think or believe. Um, those are those are very uncomfortable yeah. thoughts to have. They set up an internal conflict and then we have suffering, yeah, yeah. right? Definitely. It's not, it doesn't feel good. But you always feel good standing by your values mm -hmm. and living up to the standards you've set for yourself. And, you know, the people that, the people that are worthy of that will stand by you and they will be your friends. And the ones that, that don't or try to sway you, um, you might want to consider having some boundaries. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, so many things that you, you know, have just talked about, you know, really, you know, life lessons that I use and I teach, you know, mm -hmm. um, specifically about people, you know, people come into your life for a season. Sometimes it's a longer period. Sometimes it's a shorter period. And, you know, if it's a shorter period, it's OK. But people come in, go, you know, all the time, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's 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 OK to let them go. But what you were saying there about examining your life and, you know, again, letting people go and, and, and being aware of that. Kind of leads me on to the, the next, um, I suppose, the next point in my mind, which is energy thieves. You call them energy thieves, I call them soul suckers. <laughs> <laughs> because, because, and you folks know the kind of people we're talking about when they, you, when they walk into a room, your heart just drops. <laughs> and you're like, oh boy, it's so and so. And then they approach you 
and by the time you finish the conversation with you, you literally feel like someone has got a, a hoover and they've attached it to you and sucked all the joy and the life and everything out of you. What I was going to ask you is, is how can you protect yourself from soul suckers, energy thieves, you know, from folks that basically just want to take, take, take all the time? Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it depends on the per it depends on who the thief or the soul sucker is. Aside from <laughs> running know? away very, very quickly in either direction. <laughs> Right, right. I mean, some people it's uh, it's easy to just get away from, but some people, they might be people that, you know, are in your family or living under the same roof or, or you know, in a circle yeah. of friends um, that you still consider friends, but you just know that there's that one friend or there's that one, you know, group um, that always just kind of brings you down and yeah. makes you feel a little bit drained. Um, so that's when, again, um, when you are able to, like with friends, have boundaries, have boundaries. I mean, put some, if, if there are people that you still consider friends and acquaintances that you still do want to, you don't want to cut them out of your life, but you also can only maybe take them in small yeah. doses because, because the, you get very drained around them. So then that's, you know, you have to, I think, become very cognizant about, um, what that's going to look yeah. like and limit your time um you know depending on the kind of person you are you could if you're somebody that just sees this as a pattern with somebody that you care about you could invite them to have a conversation about it and just say i feel like you know i feel like you are suffering a lot you 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 know there's a lot of negativity yeah. is there is there any way that i could help you and, and try to you know kind of change the focus a little bit from complaining which which when you know when you're around a chronic complainer or somebody that's chronically negative um that do, that does drain a person um unless you are right there with them yeah. then you just fuel each other yeah. right but if you're not it can be draining so it you know if you can limit your time a little bit or perhaps um gently uh, point out to that person that you know maybe if they had a little bit of a, a, a different attitude about things they might feel a little bit differently and they might feel better um, that course of action isn't for everyone um, and then if it's somebody that's uh, you know you just you're around all the time you can't get away from them it could be a spouse or somebody that you live with or whatever um, I here's what I do <laughs> if I find myself in that situation, I literally sort of become an, an observer. I don't, I don't disengage. I don't ignore. But I become an observer and I look at everything like I'm watching a, a, a play on a stage. And I just think to myself, well, that's part of their charm. It's the role they're playing. And I actually just sort of in inside find the amusement of it i just look at it like it's a play playing out in front of me and and i just try to give the gift of listening yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> and and then uh you know when 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 the play is over um i uh i i go back to you know i re-inhabit my body <laughs> And at that point, they come out with, well, here's act two, scene one. Here we go. <laughs> right. Right. But, yeah, sometimes when you just can't remove yourself from a situation yeah. and there's maybe a lot of negativity, the thing is you don't have to engage in it. Yeah. You don't have to contribute to it. That's when you lose your power, yeah. too. When, when, you know, if there's nastiness and gossip going on and you decide you're going to jump in, you just gave away all your power. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you let somebody talk you into um, doing something or behaving in a way or talking in a way that really you don't want to, but you do anyway, you just gave away your power. You can still hold your power and not be in agreement with those things without actually even having to verbalize anything. You don't have to pick a fight. You don't have to say, you don't have to have an argument if you don't want to. You don't have to voice your, your opinion if it's different. You can just quietly watch the show and in your mind, you don't have to agree. You don't have to dwell on those thoughts. Yeah. So you're still standing in your own integrity without creating conflict. Absolutely. I mean, we, we talk about the, the moral compass and things that are there. And, you know, and again, like Laurie was saying earlier on, it, it takes 
practice and it takes that discipline of building you know that moral compass in their way where you're not going to easily get involved with these things because it's you know it's, sometimes it's the easiest thing in the world when people are again emotionally charged and they're firing away at you um you know to, to get involved you know and and someone was asking me the other day about you know these friendship groups and and things you know how do you know a true friend and i said well you know a true friend when you go through these situations in these valleys of life and you know the friend is still there on the other side if they're not there then be willing to let them go but um yeah and, and, and like you said i mean that was a great way of putting it you know just see it almost like as a, as a play you don't have to necessarily engage but just give the gift of listening and you know mm -hmm. i have you know i've told people before when folks have said you know well, well how do you keep a you know your moral high ground in business i said well i'm just honest and people are so forgiving and they accept you a lot more when you're honest and there is great power in honesty um, and actually, you know, standing there on your morals, but being able to say, I've gone through this, this and this. Um, right. And it makes such a such a big difference. Laurie, I, I didn't know where to place this final question because, you know, it, it was one that you could talk, you know, whether it be about relationships or whether you can talk. And it's kind of just fallen at the bottom. But I wanted to ask you, what were some of the biggest challenges of your life and things that you had to overcome? Hmm. <laughs> We're going with the deep questions today, aren't we? <laughs> Seriously, I, I I would like to have had some time to think about that. Let's see. Uh, okay, probably. I think. Seriously, my biggest challenge uh, would have been uh, when I was losing my mother okay. to cancer, right. which was about five, a little over five years ago. I think that was probably, that was a challenge of all of my, my own, you know, lifetime of personal yeah. growth, my, um, spiritual beliefs, um, what I thought I had learned about myself and life and death and, um, and so, yeah, I would say that would have been, that would have probably been it. When you don't, um, when you're, especially, I think when you're, for me, I shouldn't say especially, because it's different for everyone. So here I am, a, I've been, um, you know, working with clients and coaching for, for 12 years. Um, I'm a holistic nutrition coach. I've been, you know, learning and practicing and teaching about um, holistic nutrition and healthy eating and lifestyle and diet, all of these things. And then here, one of the closest people to me in my life, yeah. I can't help her. That and that's that's hard. Um, you know, you you have the challenge of doing everything you can and you know and then you have the challenge of having to realize there are things you don't you can't control um uh we we, we don't get to control another soul's agenda as much as we would all like to like yeah. to do that and think that we could um so, you know, that was probably a, a hard time, um, a challenging time. And I'm glad, though, that I, that I have my spiritual beliefs in place um, around all of that because that really helped me navigate through that in a, in a way that was not um, – I didn't become a, a basket case. Yeah. <laughs> um, I could be – you know, I could be strong for my yeah. – family um my sister and and uh for my mother while she was going through that and and all and all that stuff and then you know and then it's challenging though after that ha after the passing happens because naturally when it's somebody um that we uh that we love especially that's close to us you know we think about um what should i have done what could i have done how come i didn't you know you start yeah, questioning yeah, yourself yeah. And and that's um, and that's challenging. Um, you can't help it because you you know you want to do over. Yeah. But at the same time, I also was able to uh, tell myself that you know we have to we have to not be so arrogant as humans that we actually think we could change the course yeah. of yeah. somebody else's um, life uh -huh. and purpose on Earth. We don't we don't 
we don't really get to do that. It might seem on the surface sometimes like we can, but but I don't think so. So you just uh, so that was challenging. It, it it was a it was a test of my own spiritual beliefs and um and so i'm grateful that i had the foundation that i did um but yeah i think that probably would have been the big one for me because it's it is one of the things you can and and again we talk about this a lot you can learn as much as you want from books but it's when you are faced with a death or a tragic circumstance or you know xyz whatever it is um that you have to put those things into practice and into place and that's where Sometimes it can yeah. seem really overwhelming, and and uh, you know, it, in in the book we talk about transitions, um, and the whole thing is, you know, every journey begins with an end, you know, and and every everything that we go through, you know, we, we've got to learn a whole new, you know, a whole new set of skills and a whole new set of challenges and all these different things that are there, and. Um, it can be really difficult and, and challenging for, for so many other people. Laurie, is there anything mm-hmm. that you want to cover that we haven't covered, I suppose, already? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, this was amazing, John. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted with our conversation. You um, asked a lot of things that I, I didn't see coming. So that was really, yeah, and, and some different things. So that was really fun, and, and I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, we covered a lot of ground. Absolutely. <laughs> From... From me at age five to COVID twenty twenty to <laughs> all of, to to my septic issues. <laughs> I actually think that's the first time I've ever told that story to anyone. Um, yeah, like in an interview or something. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting time. Actually, that would have been a big challenge. <laughs> that was absolutely. That was now that I think about it. That was a challenging time, John. So much. <laughs> oh dear. But I always say to folks, you know, it's incredible what you can cram into and what you can accomplish in 24 hours. And you know, I list things out, and I'm I'm a big list builder. And the momentum that you get with building lists and things, um, and that's why sometimes we'll, we'll let people see the questions if they want to see them. But sometimes I don't. I just kind of see what happens and what opens up when we're doing these interviews. Laurie, where can people find you on social media should they want to get in touch? Sure. Um, so the best place is probably my website, which is lauriebischoff.com, and that's L-O-R-E-E, and Bischoff is B-I-S-C-H-O-F-F. Uh, you can find everything on there, but I am um, Lori Bischoff on Facebook, and uh, on Instagram, it's lori.bischoff. Uh, Lori, then the letter B, Life Coach on Twitter. And, of course, um, my podcast is called We're Talking Shift, and that's on all the podcast apps, and uh, it is on YouTube as well. That's really awesome. How's, uh, how's the podcast going? I should ask about that. Oh, it's just awesome. I'm just so delighted. Uh, it's been over... Oh, two years wow. now, and so um, I'm at, uh, we just passed our 100 episode mark. Um, I'm excited about some upcoming guests that uh, are going to be joining me this year. And uh, yeah, we just only only a month or five weeks ago um, went to YouTube. Wow. So before it was just, you know, on iTunes yeah. and Spotify, but now uh, doing like what you're doing here, um, we can we've got our YouTube channel set up and so everyone can see the interaction between myself and the guest which is super cool Uh, so I'm delighted with it it's it's going great we share so much good stuff to help people up level all areas of their life and uh, it's been a wonderful journey that's really awesome yeah I mean it is you know when you start doing things like this and people can see you know how you want to help people and how you are so devoted to you know just just helping people build their lives and and really get on track and they've got help that's there that's the thing that we really want to encourage you guys and girls is you're not alone in all the things that you're going i know covid right now seems like you know i'm isolated i'm alone folks you got social media you got the biggest (laughs) phone directory on the face of the planet and you can interact Mm -hmm. with people like myself like laurie literally all over the world and there's so much great content out there we don't want you to feel alone at all laurie is there anything that you want to add just before we wrap up for today 
No, I think just to add to what you just said, I look at this um, as much as you can, and I know it's more difficult for some than others as an opportunity. This this aloneness or this lack of you know doing what you normally do. It's there's always opportunity there if you look for it, and it is a time where, like you said, you've got all the information in the world at your fingertips, and so learning and growing and feeding your mind yeah. with good stuff. There's no shortage of it. So. Um, um, just take the opportunity to fill yourself up with everything good and positive that you can while you have this time because it's not going to last forever. Nothing does. It will change. Things will shift. We will get unstuck from this. And and then, you know, there's going to be a new chapter. And right now I think, um, you know, there's new things that come from chaos, and this has been a very chaotic year. So I, I just would encourage people to look for what they can do, focus on what's under their control, and, um, and know that they're going to get through it. And things could be better. They could be better if you're willing to be open to it. Absolutely. You know, it's one of the things that we always talk about is, you know, use the time that you've got wisely. Look at the opportunities that are there. You know, lockdown came. I didn't know what was going to happen. I wrote a book. You know, it, 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 you know, and it's opportunities like this. You've got to be willing to seize them. You've got to be willing to follow through and so much. Laurie, I want to thank you so much for being my incredible guest today. You've been wonderful. I want you guys to come and visit us. Uh, definitely go visit Laurie and her podcast. Listen to the stuff and the teaching that she's got. It is incredible and some amazing guests that she's got there, all with a wide variety of life experiences. And if you want to come and visit me and pre-order my brand new book, The Battles We All Face, you can at thebattlesweallface.com. You can check out my artwork as well at johnmorrisartfromtheheart.com. And I'd love to hear from you and connect with you. You can come and follow me at Mind, Body and Soul on Facebook, where we only post inspirational, motivational, and encouraging posts. Because there's tons of negativity out there, and I don't need to follow that up. And until next time, folks, this has been the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast. This has been Laurie Bischoff. I have been your host, John Morris, the painter of memories, and we will see you next time. Take care. God bless.